Martin Luther King Jr. was a charismatic leader of men with a remarkable gift for speaking. He was born on the 15th of January 1929 and became the driving force behind a mass campaign for change in America that culminated in the civil rights marches of the 50s and 60s. Tragically, he was assassinated in Memphis in 1968. That act of senseless violence denied him the chance of ever seeing his dreams growing into a reality. His widow, Caressa Scott King, remembers him as a man driven by love and a desire to see the unity of all people. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man of love who loved unconditionally. He was a man uh, who worked ceaselessly uh, to eliminate the evils of poverty, racism, and war, all forms of violence. And he was a man who believed in truth and embraced it when he discovered it. Uh, he was a man of great compassion, but he was a man of action. He worked to bring about the realization of the goals he set for himself during his lifetime, and he believed in the possibilities of all people that we could overcome uh, uh, whatever forces of injustice and oppression that, uh, we, that beset us. And he accomplished uh, a great deal in his lifetime in terms of uh, bringing about freedom and justice and, uh, and uh, many equal opportunities for not only black people, but poor people and white people as well. The Reverend King was always aware of the constant danger to his life. America, in those days, wasn't receptive to his message of equal rights and justice for all. But, says Mrs. King, he carried on regardless in the firm belief that what he was doing was right. He had a deep and abiding uh, religious faith, uh, and he believed uh, that his cause was just and that there was a redeeming uh, power in uh, one's commitment to love and nonviolence, and that if one uh, had to suffer and sacrifice, that was part of the price that was necessary to pay, because the rewards would uh, transform themselves into bringing about necessary changes, and he even uh, was willing to pay the ultimate price, and did. Uh, because he felt that that was a small price to pay uh, for the cause that he believed in and for uh, to, to bring about a, uh, a society of, of more justice and, and uh, more peace. Sixties America was a segregated world in which blacks were seen as second-class citizens with very little to say in the running of the country. However, Mrs. King believes that a lot has changed since then, especially in the area of the black representation in American politics. We lived in a uh, segregated society uh, in the 60s, and we, uh, uh, blacks and whites, were treated as, uh, and blacks were treated as, as second-class citizens and deprived of their right to vote um, their, their, all of their, their basic rights, really, uh, we were not until many campaigns did we achieve a civil rights bill that guaranteed uh, uh, public accommodations, the freedom of public accommodations, uh, the freedom of access to public accommodations, and at the same time, in that process, women in this country, all women, uh, were uh, given uh, um, um, more equal rights. Their rights became more equal 
under the Constitution than they had been. Um, in 1965, we, got, we achieved a voting rights bill, which uh, helped to bring about um, a larger number of elected officials, uh, black elected officials, and policymakers uh, in this nation. So today we have, uh, in, this, in 1965, we had um, um, less than uh, 500. Today we have uh, over 7,000 uh, black elected officials throughout the United States, and most of the mayors uh, in our larger cities are now black. And uh, we are very uh, pleased with the progress that we've made, but still we are less than one and um, half percent of the uh, total uh, elected officials of this nation. So we still have a long way to go. Yeah. We're making progress in that area. But in the area of economic justice, we have made very uh, slow progress, very slow progress. That is the most difficult area uh, of the struggle, and Martin Luther King Jr. did caution us that it would be the most difficult, and that it, it cost the nation something. Uh, the other rights that we achieved did not cost the nation anything. But if you're going to uh, achieve uh, equality uh, in the economic arena, it is going to be very costly, and the nation is not willing yet to pay that price. I do hope, though, that uh, in the not-too-distant future, uh, our nation will be able uh, to reorder its priorities, because our nation has uh, uh, understood now that the large uh, military buildup is not necessary, uh, particularly since... Uh, the uh, emergence of um, Mr. Gorbachev and and his uh, policies of perestroika and uh, the Cold War seems to be uh, ending, and there is a a um, new new social order that's beginning to I think emerge there. We uh, we feel more. I think the leadership of this nation feels more secure now uh, and, and and less inclined to to continue the build up as a matter of fact uh, it has been said by a secretary of, uh, of uh, defense that uh, we the, the budget the defense budget uh, has a potential of being cut by 180 billion dollars if that is the case uh, those monies should be directed toward uh, some of the human needs in our nation because uh, we've not made progress uh, according to to the wealth of this nation and the resources that that are here and uh, so we have too many people who are homeless too many people who are still uh, jobless uh, and people who are in poverty who have turned to drugs and and to crime because they uh, see no way out and uh, that's why Dr. King's nonviolence becomes so important. And the King Center, which is named for the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change, which is named for Dr. King, has been working on uh, training leaders in his philosophy and strategy of nonviolence at every level of our society. And it is important as we celebrate his 61st birthday, the fifth annual um, holiday and the 22nd year in the life of the King Center, which is named for Dr. King and whose mission is to perpetuate his legacy nationally and internationally and to train leadership uh, to address the problems of poverty, racism, and war in a nonviolent manner. Martin Luther King Jr. conducted his campaign for change on a platform of nonviolence, which was criticized by other black leaders at the time as hindering the cause. But Mrs. King is confident that her husband's peaceful method of struggle was the right way. There's no way that uh, I could see that anyone could feel that it was a hindrance. Uh, there would have been no way for us to accomplish these goals in such a short time. Uh, on, without nonviolence. Nonviolence was the key to the progress that we made in 12 and a half short years. Uh, we, uh, I think it was miraculous the change that 
took place here in America. And uh, uh, you know, we had lived centuries under slavery and segregation. And uh, there was no climate for change until uh, the nonviolent movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, emerged. And uh, it was essentially that method of struggle that he injected that made the difference because there have been other leaders who have uh, led masses of people and called for change, but they did not have an organized, systematic, systematic way of, uh, of teaching that method and organizing people uh, to uh, work for change. The Reverend King was a great orator who captivated his audience and drew large crowds wherever he went. His most famous speech, I Have a Dream, outlined his vision of a new America. It was a dream of a nation uh, that uh, responded to the needs of all of its people, that there, there would be a job, a decent job, an income for all people. There would be adequate housing for all people. There would be health care and, and educational opportunities for all people. Uh, there would be culture for the nurturing of the spirit, and where black and white people and um, Protestants and Catholics and Jews and Gentiles could live together uh, in peace and harmony. He felt that uh, the nation um, could afford to respond in its treatment uh, to uh, those people who had been left out uh, and left behind in a way that would assist them in uh, moving forward and closing the gap and of course the nation still has not done that uh, today we have more people in poverty than we did at the time of his death uh, and yet there have been many people who have moved up the socioeconomic uh, ladder and who are part of the middle class but those numbers are few compared to those who have been left behind and who are uh, who are struggling uh, to survive, and they are barely surviving. Um, Dr. King would be very disappointed, I'm sure, uh, if he returned today and to see those conditions. But it was in the last uh, eight years, the last nine years, we have a phenomenon in our country of homelessness and uh, people uh, who have to be fed uh, day, day to day on a daily basis by the community uh, and the government and the community within the city um, because they have no place to eat and they don't have money to buy food. And if they work a little bit, they don't have enough money to afford an apartment. And we didn't have this phenomenon of homelessness in our country prior to 1980. Martin Luther King Jr. was a special man who inspired a generation of black Americans. But has anyone emerged to fill the void left by him? Mrs. King again. I don't think that's the way it uh, it should it should be and the way it, it was to go. Uh, Dr. King lived in a period, period of time when uh, there was a need for a, a person such as a Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he was almost like... Uh, um, well, he was the Gandhi, which some people call him the American Gandhi, uh, and uh, that he was the Gandhi, the person who led the uh, civil rights movement to, to free uh, uh, not only black people but many others um, from the um, uh, shackles of, of, of oppression and the lack of equality that, uh, uh, that was so prevalent. Um, Martin Luther King, I think, uh, would be happy that so many people have emerged in government and in education and in the business professions and uh, uh, in many other areas. Uh, and they are leaders, too. They are leaders in their areas. And we have so many today uh, that are addressing problems in their area so that you don't to have a one person who is a who is a fixer is not real freedom. What he taught people is that they could, uh, through the power of nonviolence, if they 
they could empower themselves, and they themselves could uh, work uh, to uh, to uh, improve the conditions of their lives. They could stand up for their freedom. They could lobby for their freedom. They could uh, um, organize for their freedom, and that it need not be a one leader that would call uh, all of the shots or give all of the uh, you know the directions. We've seen this in many communities, uh, of the, the centralization of leadership, and that has been very good for the development of, of the people in those regions. So there is no successor to Martin Luther King. A person like Martin Luther King Jr. comes once, perhaps in a millennium. Martin Luther King Day was instituted as a public holiday in America five years ago, following a long and concerted campaign by supporters, including Mrs. King herself. I was right in the middle of it and really worked to make it happen. The work of the King Center and many of his followers, followers and certainly the efforts that we I continued to put forth uh, materialized uh, when a massive coalition celebrating the uh, I Have a Dream speech, the March on Washington in 1983, actually made it possible finally. We had worked over a number of years, and I was one of the few people who always believed that it could happen and that it would happen, and it would take time. And when the time was right, I proposed to the person who had been introducing the legislation that now is the time for it, the legislation to be brought before the floor of the Congress. And that was the process by which it eventually passed, uh, you know, the risk. And reluctantly signed into law by President Reagan. So it was not the Republican administration that caused it. It was the people who decided they wanted it. And they lobbied their congresspersons and made it happen. And, uh, you know, naturally, because I believed from the beginning that it was going to happen and it could happen, it was a great occurrence and uh, didn't take anything away from it. But I did not have the same kind of excitement that someone would have who was on the periphery and never thought that it could happen. Because I'd had lots of experience in lobbying and getting legislation passed, and I knew the process, and I knew that it could happen, and uh, when the people decided they wanted to make it happen. Mrs. King is confident that her husband's memory will continue to live on throughout history and that he'll be remembered for the great man that he was. Everybody has their own um, memory of, of Martin Luther King, Jr. And um, I think he is remembered, and it doesn't matter what I think, because uh, he has already um, uh, made uh, his uh, mark, so to speak, in history. Um, um, he is a, a person who lived by the example that he taught, and he achieved uh, tremendous progress toward advancing the humankind, and he's claimed by people all over the world of every race and every religion, and, uh, and even the non-believers, uh, as, as, as a person who lived a noble life and who transcended so much of what most people uh, find themselves bogged down with and who never achieved true greatness. He was truly a great human spirit, and some people have called him uh, the greatest spiritual leader that America has produced, and I think I could agree with that. On this very special day, Coretta King has a personal message for all of us celebrating Martin Luther King Day here in Manchester. I hope that people around the world will, and particularly uh, the listeners of this program, will be involved in celebrating Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday as a time of nonviolence, a time to act and a way to live, living the dream by getting involved in some kind of action, reaching out and helping someone, uh, feeding the poor. I know you have poor people in your 
in your countries. Uh, Martin Luther King's memory should be honored by doing something and for someone else and serving your fellow human being.